I'm going to talk about ecosystem-based fisheries management, fisheries in brackets in the Baltic Sea, uh, what it could be, and discuss a little bit if we are on the right track. So I'm working at uh, Stockholm University, uh, Baltic Sea Center, in a, in a, in a project called uh, Baltic Eye, which, which is a strategic cooperation between, between the, the foundation Baltic Sea 2020 and Stockholm University. And we are dealing with eutrophication, uh, marine habitats and, and uh, protected areas, uh, pollutants, and also fisheries. Uh, we have two people, two persons that are doing research and trying to communicate research on fisheries to decision makers. It's me and my colleague Maciej Tomczak. So, today's topic, ecosystem-based management. What does it actually mean? Well, this is the picture that could illustrate it. Uh, that's a strong focus on one thing now when it comes to fisheries management, but there might be a risk that we lose the complexity. And I think uh, that uh, Willem explained it with, with, the, with the eel management uh, just in the presentation before lunch now as well. So this is also some kind of of, of uh, illustration that can show what it actually is. It's uh, some kind, some, some time to balance human, different human activities uh, in a multiple uh, context. And um, there are a number of different definitions uh, on ecosystem-based management. It could be ecosystem-based approach to management and so on. And I'll go through them a little bit more um, uh, in detail later on. But I will say that this is a definition I found on, on the uh, UNFAO uh, uh, webpage. And important things here is that we have the, the some kinds of similar ideas among uh, different uh, decision makers or, or stakeholders. That we have uh, good science and we must be some kind of adaptive and, and flexible uh, management uh, as well and all different stakeholders should be heard. And it's quite, quite important, I would say, that they have a long-term perspective as well. And actually, I've uh, uh, arranged this pres presentation quite in a quite similar way as this. Uh, when I I'm going to talk about... Uh, uh, well, I've already uh, discussed a little bit what, what actually it could mean, but uh, we'll, well, I, I'll, the first part of this presentation I will devote on, on, on the resource, the state of, of, uh, of uh, uh, the fish resources, or commercial fishes mostly. And it's going to be a li little bit overlap with what uh, Martin presented earlier. Uh, and also I'm going to discuss what level science is today. Um, and thirdly, what level is management today? Here I'm going to talk a little bit about different EU ma uh, environmental directives, uh, of course the, the common fisheries policy as well, and, the, and a little bit of the, on the, and the newly uh, agreed and installed multi-annual plan for Baltic Sea. And also, I'm going to talk, as I should say, that level management also going to talk quite a lot about the, the political structure. Um, and lastly, uh, I would, would like to give some recommendations on how it could be achieved, actually, uh, or improved anyway. Uh, I think it's important to, to identify ecological connections that are not really included in the management today. Uh, and I think there are it's important to, to manage the whole ecosystem, all factors. Uh, that is not really done today as well, or, or either. Um, and finally, we need to have a long-term and precautionary management. So, this is uh, just to put the fisheries in the Baltic in perspective. We are here now. Uh, and not really, but, but uh, 
the, this, this, this illustrates how the fishes looked like. One hundred years ago, or uh, we had, it was much more. It was not not as a productive uh, system, and actually the the fisheries relied on totally different fish, uh, species. Flatfish was very important in the beginning of the of the, of the century. Uh, from the beginning, it was was mostly plaice, and then then, then the flounder became more more uh, important. Then herring. Uh, Increased in fisheries, and then we know, <coughs> yeah, from the 80s, the, the cod explosion, everybody's aware, aware of that. And then we have the system as it is today, and as Martin presented this morning, the sprat dominated system. This is also a little bit overlap with Martin's presentation, but just to illustrate the overall increase of, of uh, catches during the last century. When we talk about the commercial species, it's actually just a few. It's, uh, it's one stock of, of uh, stickleback, several stocks of herring, and we have also the eastern and western cod stocks. And then we have place. I didn't put them in, in this, uh, in this, in this uh, uh, feature here. But Actually, the, com the state of these stocks is quite good. The clupids or the herring and sprat. However, it's not the, 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 yeah, the, the state for, for both the cold stocks is more, more, more worrisome, I would say. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit now just about these stocks. Starting with the eastern Baltic cod. And this is actually how they looked a couple of years ago. Now it's a little bit, bit better, but they used to be in really, really tiny and meager condition, uh, slim, slim, and, uh, slim conditions. And, and also that they, are, they were um, much smaller in size than they used to be. Here we can see the trends, how it, how small size cods have become much, much more abundant, and uh, larger ones are some, yeah, the, the biggest ones we don't find in the, in the, in the eastern uh, population. So why is this? Well, I think it's combined effects. We're not really sure, but there has been proposed parasites, and the, and the degree of, of, of uh, parasitation on, on these individuals has increased quite a lot. But I would say that this perhaps is also an, an effect of, uh, and I should say that this also relates to that, that gray seals have become more abundant, which are the end hosts of, of these parasites. But what's the chicken or hen here is difficult to say, because when cod are in, in poor condition, they are more vulnerable to, to, to be parasites, uh, to be infested by, by parasites as well, of course. But most likely it's combined effects by these two. Increased areas with hypoxic and anoxic bottoms, uh, and then we have crowding effects due to this, and also selectivity of fisheries. So, when we look at the, these uh, anoxic areas, we see that the there has been increase in anoxic uh, areas, and uh, this is how it looks now. Big parts of the central Baltic is actually totally uh, depleted from oxygen when it comes to the bottom uh, seafloor. And that naturally affects also the benthic communities. And, quite, uh, and, and these benthic uh, animals, as saduria, uh, skorve, and, and the mussels and so on. They are quite uh, especially scorv is very important for cod as as uh, as food, especially when they are in small when cod for small cod. And when these areas are 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 reducing, of course, of course the the abundance of scorv is also uh, saduria is also decreasing, and it's a shortage of food for them. Selectivity. That, when I say that, it's actually meaning that what, what kind of, what, what individuals are actually caught in fisheries. 
And when we look at the fisheries in the Baltic Sea, it has not only, only changed over the years from um, uh, depending on species, species that are caught, but also on how they are caught. And nowadays, well, if you look at the Eastern Baltic cod, trolls, uh, demersal trolls are the, the far most important ones. They catch more than 90% of, of, of all the catches. And of course, if you have one type of gear with one type of selectivity that catch more or less all fish above a certain size, that can have effects on the population. So this is just to recapitulate a little bit how it looks like. Uh, actually, the dark uh, areas or uh, yeah, uh, figures here are good condition with some, when something works. The, the white ones is when it's not, not really working. And you see, if you look at the, the la latest uh, period here, we see there has not, not been so much inflow except for last year. It was big inflow. Uh, of, of, of saline uh, oxygenated uh, marine water from the Atlantic into the Baltic Sea. Uh, and there has been a lot of other problematic issues for, for the, for the uh, Eastern Baltic cod. But, strangely enough, recruitment has, has, not, not, um, has, has worked anyway. And that could be the effects of that they have this stunted uh, population, small size population now, and they started to reproduce when they are really, really small, as small as about 20 centimeters. So that was the eastern cod stock. If you look at the western cod stock, uh, I'm quite sure that, that you have been, most of you have followed the, the, the news the latest week when they have decided for, for much higher quotas. Uh, for this stock than what than the, than, than the scientific advice was. And actually, if you look at most trends have gone downward, downwards for this stock the, the, the last couple of decades. Uh, and especially worrisome is also now that the recruitment is, is, is not really seems to work. But on the positive side, there are some still some individuals that that uh, that exists. This, this, uh, that, that could be very, very important for the whole stock. And this is a, a large female belonging to the West, Western Baltic cod stock that are called out, out, outside here in the Funen archipelago. And uh, of course, these individuals, individuals are, could be important for the, for the stock. And um, the reason for them that they still exist here is that we have actually in this area a trawling ban. And I'm sure you have heard about the Oresund, the, the strait, uh, that they have the same uh, development there. Also larger individuals, and there is a trolling ban. So, when we do then consider the management of, of the fisheries, the, the resource as it is today, it's quite severe, I would say, that if you look at the, 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 the percentage of stocks when they, when they have decided quotas, the, the total allowable catches, has been, uh, in, in all years, the last, ten, the last decade, they, they have, have, um, they have, this, uh, they have st some stocks, and sometimes many, many stocks that they have, for the, in, in Baltic Sea, for the Baltic stocks, that they have actually decided for tax that overshoot the, the commission's proposal, which is most, in most cases in line with the scientific advice. And sadly, this was also the case this year, when both the, cold, for, uh, for example, both the, 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 the cold stocks, they decided higher quotas for than, than the science uh, uh, proposed. So, when we talk about the science, where are the science? What? Yeah, where is the science today? This is a very schematic picture of what an ecosystem-based management could be, starting with single stock species management, towards the ecosystem approach to fisheries management, uh, when some uh, environmental con conditions uh, and some quite, quite easy predation-prey relations are included. And then we have ecosystem-based fisheries management, when you have more about multi-species um, interactions and, and management towards a total ecosystem-based management, where different uh, yeah, uh, factors of human um, 
activities are, are included. And I would say that today we are somewhere here when it comes to science. Uh, and in some cases, actually, seeing still single species. So, multi-species considerations, what could that be? This is a very general illustration I'm going to show you now. It's more complex in the real world, but just to give you an idea what, what a lot of uh, scientists are working on right now, is to develop models that take into account the, the biological interactions between different commercial species. For example, in this case, cod, sprat, and herring. And when we see, and also then, how they are influence, influencing each other. So when we have, if you look at the catches on cod, for example, if we, if we would reduce fisheries on cod, then, of course, the stock would, would increase. It would be uh, higher, lead to higher pressure on sprat that would have results on the sprat stock, uh, stock and, of course, as well on the, on the uh, fisheries of for sprat. And also, that goes in the other way, of course. Uh, what happened here? Yeah, sorry. So if you fish more sprat, then uh, uh, that would, would, would could lead to, to that, that the stock population of cod goes down because there's lack, lack, lack of prey for it. But herring has been shown to be not as influenced by stroke, cod and, and sprat as, as uh, these as a cod and sprat are of each other. So, but I would say that there are some considerations when we talk about multi-species uh, multi uh, management, because these models are still the in development and they're based on several assumptions. For example, that there should be geographical overlap in the, in the distribution among these species, which is not uh, necessarily the case, or actually it is not really the case. Uh, when we look, for example, on cod and sprat. And the whole, when, when they are presented, it's quite often so that you look at the maximum, to, to maximize catches, how much given uh, uh, some, some um, uh, conditions, uh, uh, political conditions, or how, how, sh how could, could these catches be maximized? And there's no really, uh, uh, concerns to ecosystem consequences. And so I would say that, that they need to be combined with better uh, communication on how, they, they, how this would affect the ecosystem and also uh, could, could, could be combined also to, to, um, with risk distributions, what will happen to ecosystem or stock development. There are some really interesting uh, and uh, promising uh, um, work going on here uh, now. For example, the EU-funded Mori Frame, when also different kinds of st stakeholders as fishermen are working together with scientists to develop some kind of, of different scenarios depending on the questions that are asked. So, and, and one other very important aspect that is not really evaluated and included in the, in the fisheries management today, is the economy of fishes. Uh, this is a graph showing, this is not unpub published yet, but, but it sh shows that if you have maximum economical yield, it would actually be lower. In most cases, it is lower than both the advice and agreed tax. Ex uh, the exceptions are in periods when they have real, really precautionary advice because, um, yeah, the state of the stock has been really, really, really poor. So, how is how is fisheries managed today? Well, if you look at the, all these different stakeholders that are utilizing the Baltic Sea and its resources, it's only fisheries that are included in the management. So, so fisheries is very much included, uh, in managed in, se in separation, in isolation from, from the rest. The same goes for the species, of course. Here we have very uh, 
uh, uh, typical Baltic species, seals, cormorants, harbor porpoise, coastal uh, uh, fish species, and so on. But it's only the commercial species that are managed. So when we talk now also about ecosystem-based management, we need to be, be, we can see it in the legal texts how it is used. And if we in EU and, 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 and uh, in the EU uh, uh, environmental legislation, it is mentioned in most of the of the different uh, directives and so on. But here I'm going to mostly focus on uh, how the overlap between marine, the Marine Strategy Framework Directive and the Common Fisheries Policy and its implementation with the, the plan that I talked about before, the technical re regulation that is the, the deciding how, or, or, or uh, regulating uh, how, where and when to fish. And I will say that the Marine Strategy Framework Directive is actually a very, very good basis for ecosystem-based management. Uh, when it comes to topics, anyway, uh, because they had a lot of different aspects, as you see in this, in, uh, in this pie chart of the, of the ecosystem. And of course, uh, uh, commercial fishes is one of them. But the problem is that it's only managed uh, more or less on a national level, although there, there are this uh, harmonization on the, on the Baltic level uh, through HELCOM. But in many ways, I would say that, that the common fish for its policy uh, should consider the, the objectives and, and the, the and the and the uh, and, 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 and these these uh, different uh, uh, areas, focus, yeah, yeah, descriptors as they call it, that that, that are that are um, covered by the marine framework strategy directive. Uh, most obvious uh, overlap is, of course, between uh, between the, these these two two different uh, legal texts is, is between uh, uh, is, is in when it comes to commercial fisheries, uh, but also on food web structures and sea floor integrity. And within EU now, uh, all the fisheries uh, policy has be, been regionalized. So there are, uh, from, uh, the, the, there's been, a, uh, within the common fisheries policy that, that was decided a couple of years ago, it's quite clear that they, wanted, they want now their decisions uh, to, to be taken on more on a regional uh, uh, level. And that means regional level in this case, in, in this context, means a sea basin level. So there could be North Sea or the Baltic Sea, for example. And in the Baltic, we have these regional bodies, they have Helcom, Baltfish, and we also have in, in, an advisory council. And Baltfish is uh, the Helsing, uh, Hel Hel Helcom is the, yeah, Hel the, the Helsinki Commission. I'm sure that most of you are aware, aware of it, uh, but it's, uh, it's composed by the different environmental ministries um, from the different member states of the, or the Baltic states. I would say so. It's, it's, uh, it's EU member states in M plus plus Russia, and they deal with a lot of things. But one of their very central uh, obligations now is that they are the coordinator of the harmonisation for the Marine Strategy Framework Directive among the Baltic member states. We also then have Baltfish, which is a quite newly formed. Uh, organization and so it's in, in, and it's the, the fisheries ministries that that uh, meets here in Sweden is uh, and uh, the people that work for on the Narings departmentet uh, and uh, for for Sven Erik Bucht uh, and it has a circulating presidency today Germany is the, uh, has has the, the presidency there has been a debate now that is uh, not as transparent as, as it uh, could be. For example, it has no secretariat and no good website. And it has open forum meetings, so, so environmental NGOs and BSAC, I'm going to talk more about BSAC later on, 
they can go to these meetings and present what they think about quotas and about uh, different management plans and so on. But all the de decisions and, 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 uh, and discussions are in, happen behind closed doors on, in high-level group meetings. And they produced advice to, to mostly the Commission. Baltic Sea Advisory Council is uh, then also an advisory council to the Commission and to Baltfish. And it's now very much uh, fisheries industry driven because they have the majority. Uh, and uh, they are also environment, env environmental NGOs, uh, also included, but they are in the minority. Uh, they call the other interest groups, it's not strictly environmental NGOs. And this has been quite a big bias towards large-scale industry here, I would say, representation, but it's getting better. So, Baltfish, uh, they are the main, um, yeah, the, the, the main policy body when it comes to actually deciding for fish in the Baltic, then. Uh, or giving proposals, and they're dealing strictly with these, these um, fisheries issues. The implementations of um, uh, the, the common fisheries policy, the amount to annual plan, tax and quotas, and ho try to see to, to if there is, uh, could be a harmonization of, of national fisheries regulations, and look at these technical measures, where and why, not why perhaps, but where and how and, and when to fish. And then we have Helcom. And sorry for this quite complex picture here. But it's just to show that the awesome and other, other stuff that they, they are dealing with as well. And what, I, what, is, not, what is lacking today, I would say, is, uh, is some kind of uh, communication and, and uh, cooperation between these two. And when Baldfish was installed, actually, it was uh, discussed if it could be something else. Uh, uh, not only this, the, um, uh, dealing with, with fishes, and actually Baltimore was, was, has been proposed as, as a name for that, and that didn't happen, uh, unfortunately. I also have International Council for the Exploration of the Sea here, ISIS. As you know, that, that's the main scientific body. And of course, it's very, very important that they are included in this, in, in this uh, management as well, especially when it comes to different requests because ISIS are mostly working on, on requests on developing different research uh, answers to different research que questions and management questions. So, it's not really clear who would have a mandate to decide on ecosystem-based management in the Baltic, I would say. One idea could be to, to divide the different uh, uh, responsibility, so we'd have more, more ISIS and Helcom would have a more of a prep preparatory uh, 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 responsibility, and then Bolt Fish, or what it should be called, perhaps not on, not only with, with dealing with fish, could be the ones that that actually would propose towards the the, the EU apparatus as as it is now, uh, and we should have a much more balanced. Uh, Baltic Sea Advisory Council, I would say, in that case, to deal with all these different complex uh, issues. Uh, now, I want to talk about some other stuff that's, uh, that could also, it's very important, I would say, to, so, so what is, that, and, and, and that is actually missing today in the management and that is to ident identify other ecological connections. Stickleback. We talked about, about it before, and this is actually... Some of the things here that I'm going to mention is actually exactly the same that Martin brought up before. So, sticklebacks could be... Uh, we we have, have this thing with sticklebacks and, and, and their re relation to predatory fish, and also to filamentous algae. And the coastal in the coastal areas, and also there is one thing that I would just like to present uh, this is and, and discuss a little bit uh, about. It could be the stickleback or actually the, the linkage between the open sea and this the coastal 
environment, and for that sake, could also be managed. This is just another picture to illustrate how sticky back has increased during the last decades. And this is exactly the same thing as, as uh, Martin uh, told us before. The role of importance of, of having predatory fish in the system. Because they eat sticklebacks, and sticklebacks eat uh, these this grazers. And, and these grazers are very important to keep the larger macroalgae uh, clean, should I say, from, from, so they're not covered by filamentous uh, 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 algae. And if we have this system, there's actually a positive feedback loop for, for the predatory species as well, because we also then, uh, uh, the, 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 the young and juveniles of, of uh, the predatory fish, they are depending on having a macroalgae to seek shelter in. But if we have more stickleback, we also have less grazers, and that would, would actually and then that have negative feedback on the on the predator fish that are reduced, uh, yeah, perhaps not extinct, but but they they are, uh, 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 yeah, we have fewer predator fish in, in in areas with a lot of stickleback. And this is just to illustrate how it looks like. Uh, of course, when we have this vegetated, uh, well, filamentous algae covered macro algae. When these, uh, di these, these uh, die, uh, it leads also to anoxic bottom condi conditions and not good yeah, uh, habitats for recruitment for fish. So more recruitment areas leads to more predatory fish. But if we have stickleback present, we don't have that much predatory fish. Another thing that I think could be of importance it is to see the overlap between stickleback and, and sprat. Uh, as Martin told us before, we have, uh, stickleback has spent large parts of their, their, their life out in the open sea system. Uh, and it actually has been found now that they compete quite a lot when it comes to food with, with, uh, uh, with the sprat or compete, I don't know, but they have there's a, there's a strong diet overlap anyway. And these are uh, really new figures that, uh, that are um, um, presented here. When we can see how the overlap between herring, sprat and stickleback is very, very high, especially during summer. And especially if you look at the medium-sized fish that are about the same size as grown-up uh, stickleback. So one could question how influenced are actually stickleback by sprat and sprat fisheries then? Because now, as it is now, whenever we have more stick, uh, whenever we see that we have a big recruitment and productivity of sprat in the system fisheries uh, quotas are in dramatically increased uh, dire directly. And um, if Sprat is a big competitor to, to Stickleback, uh, I would say that th this could actually be an important factor that should also be in included in the management. And I forgot to say that, but when they do calculations now and estimations on how much Stickleback that, that actually is, they estimated it to be around 8 to 10 percent of the whole Baltic fish biomass. And that's a lot. So, there is. Um, um, now we'll talk a little bit about the importance of also including further uh, actors in the system. This is an actually an un, un, unpublished study uh, that is very interesting, and I think 
it's needed as well because there's been quite a big debate about uh, what what actors actually catch most fish when it comes to uh, especially coastal coastal species. So if you compare recreational fishes and and commercial fisheries on perch and pike, we see that recreational fisheries is actually much higher. But then if we would include cormorants and seals, we see at that for that especially for cormorants, cormorants they eat a lot more sprat than than the other uh, uh, actors catch together. And I think this is very important to because the whole discussion around seals and cormorants now has been so polarized. Some people think that we should kill them all, and some people say that we shouldn't, we shouldn't talk about this. But I think we, we need to consider this in the management, and all the information should be there. Saying that, I don't, I don't think that we should, should kill all the cormorants, not, not at all, but we, should have, we, we must start to think about some kind of way to manage it. And of course, also when it comes to seals, we have the effects on the commercial uh, fisheries. And this is uh, uh, photos taken by, by uh, small-scale fishermen from Karlskrona, uh, Fisk Online, I should say, say the, Bengt Larsson is his name. And, but when it comes to management, it doesn't really have to be that you should kill them off or hunt them, uh, but it could also be how to adjust to it. And there are some some, some, kind, uh, some, some innovations that have been tested when it comes to gears. For example, here we have uh, cod pots that are seal safe, and they are seal safe traps that are used for salmon fisheries, and these ones have actually also been used and tested for, for cod fisheries. But, if, if it, but for both these passive gears, and as in for most other passive gears, management has also been to, to adjust it to, to these kind of fisheries, because these kind of fisheries need more fish in the water than if you compare, for example, trawling. So, I show you this picture in the beginning. And if you see here, that's a, in, the, in, in this picture, this is a it's a big weight towards the human dimensions of the system. And I would say it's even more so uh, when we look at the management today. Uh, and I would say that we need to consider the Baltic ecosystem, the, the, the biological and environmental factors more. And one other aspect is that it's when we look at especially the fisheries management, it's very, very short term in, in its thinking. We only produce quotas for the next year uh, and, uh, and, and, and so on. We need, we need to have better long term management. And um, this is just to, just to show this we have these this scenarios produced by my colleagues, uh, Barbara Bauer, who is up here, <laughs> and Matsche Tomschak uh, at the Baltic Sea Center who showed how the cod stock, the cod population, the eastern cod population, would change if we have different um, nutrition loads. So this is this the first scenario here, if, is, um, if the, the nutrition load would increase in the rate as, 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 as expen exponential as it has been doing for the last decades. If it just would, would uh, uh, increase slightly or at the trend as it has today, or if it actually would, would be in reductions in the nutrients uh, that are uh, coming to, to the sea. And as you see here, in a 10 to 15 years perspective, of course, it would be better to have less uh, nutrition in water. And that mostly is related, to, as I understand it, in a way to hypoxic areas and so on. And, and, uh, uh, and, and the, yeah, how, how much of the of the of the bottom uh, seafloor that is anoxic or hypoxic? But if you look at it from a 10 to 15 years perspective and compare it to a, to a longer perspective, eight years perspective, we see here that it's actually uh, not not as good a development, and that factor is climate change in this case. 
So that's, that's why we need to have a more precautionary approach. So some conclusions then. Are, is ecosystem-based management a milestone or a sidetrack? Well, I would say it is definitely on the right way, right, right way but I, we're not there. Uh, and we're not really on the track, <laughs> I would say. Uh, and we need to hold time to, to consider the, 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 the basis, the, 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 the resource. And um, we must also always think about, the, when it comes to fish, then, the reciprocal uh, relationship between fish and the ecosystem. And have a more integrated assessment and management, include more, more different aspects of, of, uh, of uh, the ecosystem. For example, these, both the coastal and the open sea management. And also then work on scientific requests, especially when all stakehold, uh, more stakeholders should be considered. For example, recreational fisheries are not not so in, in, in included, involved in the, in, the, in, the, in the discussions when it comes to com on commercial species. Uh, not that much in a way, but when it comes to salmon, of course, but, but not so much for the rest. And of course, there should be considerations also for the recreational fisheries, I would say. This is very, very important. We need to have a mandate to decide on ecosystem-based management. And it is a step-by-step -step process. Finally, how complicated must it be? I mean, I think actually, to be honest, if we just would decide for precautionary, more precautionary uh, tax and quotas, I think we would be, I mean, quite far. Um, that's, but you know, a big step towards it. So, thanks. <laughs>